Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone, good morning. Thank you for attending today's public meeting of the California Technology Assessment Forum, otherwise known as CTAF, a partner of ICER, the Institute of Clinical and Economic Review. I am Rena Fox, Chair of CTAF and of today's forum. Today we will be discussing aducanumab for Alzheimer's disease, effectiveness and value. At the beginning of each meeting, we ask each of our CTAF panel members to disclose any financial relationships with industry. Every member of the CTAF panel who is present has met the ICER conflict of interest policy. Would each CTAF member introduce themselves, their work, and note whether they have any updates to this declaration? I will call on each CTAF member and I will begin. I'm Rena Fox, professor of medicine and a clinician re researcher in the Division of General Internal Medicine at UCSF. Okay, we'll start now. Ann Raldo. Hello, um, I am an assistant professor at UCLA, also a radiation oncologist, um, and I have no updated conflicts of interest. Thank you. Annette Langer Gould. Hi, I am the regional lead for clinical and translational neuroscience at Kaiser Permanente Southern California. Um, and a clinician researcher, I have no updates to my conflicts of interest. Thank you, Annette. Bob Collier. Let me unmute it. My name is Bob Collier. I'm a patient advocate uh, for 30 plus years with, working with researchers with a group called Patient Advocates and Research. I have absolutely no conflicts. Thank you, Bob. Elizabeth Murphy. <clears throat> Hi, I'm a professor of medicine at UCSF and chief of the division of endocrinology at San Francisco General Hospital, um, and I have no conflict. Thank you, Elizabeth. Felicia Cohn. Good morning, I'm Felicia Cohn, a bioethics director for Kaiser Permanente in Orange County and a clinical professor at the University of California, Irvine, no conflicts. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Klingman. Yeah, hi, Jeff Klingman. I am the uh, chair of neurology at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California and no conflicts. Thank you, Jeff. Catherine Phillips. Good morning, everybody. Catherine Phillips, professor of health economics, University of California, San Francisco, no new updates. Thank you, Catherine. Ralph Brindis. Hello there, Ralph Brindis. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at UCSF, trained in cardiology and uh, cardiovascular outcomes uh, science, and also the senior medical officer of the American College of Cardiology's National Cardiovascular Data Registry. And I have no uh, relationships, new relationships to disclose. Thank you, Ralph. Richard Seiden. Good morning, uh, Richard Seiden. I'm a patient advocate and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Richard. Sanket Duvra. Hi, Sanket Duvra. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at UCSF. I'm a staff cardiologist and health services researcher based at the San Francisco VA Medical Center. And I have no new updates to my conflicts of interest. Sai Lee. Uh, hello, this is uh, Saley from uh, UCSF, Professor of Medicine, Division of Geriatrics. No conflicts. Thank you. And Tony Sowery. Uh, good morning. I represent the National Patients Advocate Foundation. I have no conflicts. Okay. And Joanna Smith. I'm Joanna Smith. Um, I have a practice as an independent healthcare advocate in Berkeley, California. No updates. Thank you, everyone. At this point, we will also ask our individual patients and clinical experts to introduce themselves and declare any potential conflicts of interest if they have any to disclose. Dr. Sarah Kremen. Uh, Dr. Victor Henderson, Laura Jones, and Matthew Baumgart. Yes, this is Matthew Baumgart, um, Vice President of Health Policy at the Alzheimer's Association. 
uh, the Alzheimer's Association um, received 0.89% uh, of its total 2020 contributed revenue from the biotech pharma pharmaceutical diagnostics and clinical research industry, including 0.15% from Biogen and um, ESI. Let me, hold on, I'm sorry, I apologize. I skipped a CTAF member, my apologies, uh, Jeffrey Hotch. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Hotch. I'm a professor in chief of the Division of Health Policy and Management in the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of California at Davis, and I have no updated conflicts of interest. And that was my fault, so I just saved the best for last, Jeff. Sorry about that. Um, okay, back to uh, Dr. Sarah Kremen. I'm Sarah Kremen. I'm a behavioral neurologist and, uh, and uh, chair of, of the, my division. And uh, I am at the Jonah Goldberg Center for Alzheimer's and Memory Disorders at Cedar sinai Medical Center. Uh, and I served as a site PI for aducatumab trials prime and engaged and I have no other updates. Thank you. Dr. Victor Henderson. Hello, I'm a professor of epidemiology and neurology at Stanford University. I direct the Stanford Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which is NIH supported and no conflicts and no updates. Thank you. And Laura Jones. Good morning. Uh, I am a former caregiver of a patient and I have no conflicts. Thank you, everyone. I would also add a reminder to everyone, whether it's uh, later during the policy roundtable or during any public comment, uh, that any individuals making public comments announce any financial relationships with industry or other potential influences on judgment before you speak. We will also present this information publicly um, on slides. And at this point, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Steve Pearson, president and founder of ICER. Steve. Great, thank you very much, Rena, and members of the CTAF and all those watching. Also a special thanks um, now and at the end of the meeting, we'll make sure to make further note of the thanks we give to our clinical experts and patient experts and all those who will provide um, input into today's meeting and who have already had an important influence on our uh, report development over the past um, eight plus months. So at each um, CTAF meeting, we start with a quote from the patient perspective about the burden of disease or about the need for, for, for treatment. And I realized that um, I would assume almost every single member of the CTAF, um, certainly many of you watching, We'll have the sense that you could fill in this quote yourself um, on behalf of you or your family. Um, and so partly because it also discloses my own personal interest and stake and perspective, I'm going to give you a patient perspective with my mother. This is a, a, on the web, uh, there's a, a memorial uh, advocacy award named after my mother, Joanne Pearson who died several years ago. Um, my mom was a, a brilliant woman. She raised me and my brother and sisters in California. Um, and after doing that, she started a business. And then she got really invested in environmental and land use activism. Through that, she led a lot of different efforts. She ended up becoming president of our town council, but she also led the, the San Diego City Council and the California Coastal Commission to adopt new measures to protect the coastline of California. And she re received numerous awards for her activism and her, her work in, in that area. She was at full flower doing this when the first signs of Alzheimer's began in her mid sixties. And she never wanted to talk about it, but we started to notice the problems and it, it, it kind of accelerated in fits and spurts over the years as it often does. But ultimately it decimated her and my father and was a huge burden to our family. They had to move from their home of 50 years because he wanted to stay with her, but he couldn't take care of her at home. And we had help at home. My brother and sisters and I were flying to California and spending time with them on a regular basis, doing everything we could. We all had that personal sense of 
physical care of my mom. And, you know, my dad started to show signs of Alzheimer's as well. So we had to move them into an assisted living facility, but it broke his heart to have to do that. Uh, but he wanted to be with her. And she started having difficulty ambulating, um, difficulty speaking at all. Um, and his, as his Alzheimer's progressed, he was in true agony because he felt his memory slipping away. Um, he realized that he didn't even sometimes remember that he was married and that devastated him when it came back to him. So this was a very hard time. He passed away first and she just continued to decline, she couldn't walk at the end at all, uh, lost the ability to speak, um, but it was always her baseline characteristic was to smile. And it was the last thing that she would always do with all of us when we came to visit. The last time I did visit, she had declined further and was basically catatonic. And this is how she spent the last month or so of her life. And so, this reality, this burden, it affects many of us, maybe all of us at some point right now. And so we often ask at the beginning of our ICER meetings, why are we here today? And obviously patients, families, we as a country hope for a future with effective ways to prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease. This is a common shared hope for a better future. So we're here today because there's a new treatment that's been approved by the FDA. And the day that happens, there is a, usually a conscious sense of celebration. And the celebration is a hope of having something to try, something to do. It's a celebration also of years of commitment and input from patients doing the clinical trials, of the risk and the investment of manufacturers and others in the venture capital and investment community to support new innovative treatments. So there's a real sense of celebration tempered frequently by questions. There are questions always about who should use this new treatment because there's always some uncertainty about the evidence it launched. And that translates through to questions clinically about who should get, you know, who should be treated with something. How do we talk about risks and benefits? There are coverage questions at the beginning. Day one after FDA approval, patients uh, were showing up asking for aducanumab, and doctors didn't have good questions, I mean, good answers to questions about coverage. But we'll be talking a fair amount today about how this is evolving and some of the perspectives on this um, headed forward. And there are almost always concerns about the price and the cost, both for individual patients, but others in the healthcare system. And this is an important part of why we're here today. Um, I told you a story about uh, my own mother. Um, there are others in the system who aren't even on this phone call, this webcast, and another few stories to tell you briefly, because others in the healthcare system also hope for a future with effective treatments, but they also live a daily existence, a daily reality of dealing with rising healthcare costs. So the first gentleman at the left, Mr. Edlow, is a pharmacist himself, and he's been very active in his community in Virginia, trying to give voice to the challenges that people in underserved communities face in trying to afford their drugs, but also their overall health insurance. And he's, he's, he's dedicated much of his career to serving that community, both again, at the bedside, if you will, as a pharmacist, but also advocating for better coverage and better affordability. These other folks were all in publicly available articles in the news facing challenges with their own health care costs. The Whitman family in Alaska was a story of a, of, a, of a family that had to give up health insurance. They couldn't afford the premiums. They didn't qualify for Medicaid. And the parents were very worried because the kids had had several injuries that they didn't feel that they could take them to the emergency room for, just leading to a lot of stress and obviously concerns about their health. And the McCoo family in, in Minnesota, this was in the news relatively recently, um, their daughter has cancer and they as a family have gone deep into medical debt despite having insurance. And so we have this confluence of problems in our healthcare system that we know in some sense, many families, while obviously wanting treatments and hoping for treatments, there are others in the system, all of us who also have to think about 
the broader affordability and the effects on real people of healthcare costs increasing. Just another fact to, to steer us on that. I was surprised to read though that in a survey done uh, recently by a company called Credit Karma, 21 million Americans are in medical debt in April of 2021 facing collection. 21 million Americans in our country. That's obviously unacceptable, but it's also just part of the broader framework in which we meet today to talk about the evidence and the value of aducanumab. So ultimately, and I chose this um, graphic because uh, I mentioned my mom started a, a company. It was a plant and seed company. As we talk about the need, as we talk about the hope, as we talk about um, the pain, the suffering, the loss of the individual patients and their families, we just have to remember that around us all is a community of others, other families, and people whom we have to think about as we build a future, of the future healthcare system that works for everybody. One in which we can absolutely drive for the best available treatment and have enough resources to create new innovative approaches for that patient at the center of our focus without losing uh, the sight, if you will, in our mind's eye of the needs and the future of other people around us. So this is why we're here today. And I'm glad you had a chance to be introduced to the members of the California Technology Assessment Forum. Um, I need to tell you just a little bit of background about ICER, which is the convening host for today's meeting. First, our sources of funding, which is kept updated on our website. As you can see, the majority of our funding comes from nonprofit foundations, not associated with the healthcare industry. The primary funder there is the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. We also receive about 20, 21% uh, direct contributions from life science companies and health plans and provider groups to support a separate policy summit and our other non-report related activities. And we have a, about a 10% funding from, from government sources. I should note that Biogen is one of our manufacturers that contributes to our policy summit program. The ICER report that's the backbone of the discussion today um, started well over eight months ago. It was an extension because of the extended timeline for FDA approval, but it began with scoping. That's input and guidance from patient groups, clinical experts, the manufacturer, and other stakeholders to really kind of help us know what we don't know um, and to steer us towards really understanding, especially from the patient perspective, what is the the need, what is the view of the diversity, diversity of the experience with the condition, um, and how do we understand value from their perspective? So we take that guidance and we do a review of the evidence, and we also do a cost effectiveness modeling, um, which goes through uh, several cycles of public comment and revision. And we're also um, uh, fortunate to have expert reviewers. In this case, you've already been introduced to two of them, Dr. Henderson and Dr. Kremen. We also had Peter Newman, who's the director of the Center for the Evaluation of Value and Risk in Health at Tufts. And we had a panel of reviewers from the Alzheimer's Association. None of these folks should be assumed to agree with everything or anything specific in our report, but they help provide very important feedback to us. Um, uh, and we appreciate that. So in the report, our report is structured with evidence um, and perspectives to support a broader discussion about value. And just to show you in a sense how that is structured, we think about value as a very complex, comprehensive concept. It's hard to grasp all the different facets of it, but at the bottom, if you will, at the base, it starts with whether treatments can help us live longer. Um, some do, many don't. Um, other treatments though can help us return to better function or help us slow our decline from the condition, from the disease that uh, is being suffered. We look at the total cost overall when we talk about cost effectiveness. We're not just concerned about what's gonna be spent on pills or doctors or hospitals. We're concerned about the total costs within the health system because it's that total cost that really affects what we have to pay for health insurance premiums and what the trade-offs are with the, the benefits and the harms that we do as those costs increase. So beyond those, in some sense, core measures, there are other really important aspects of value. We call potential benefits beyond health, and we'll have votes on some of these specific aspects 
of how even health as it improves can give us broader benefits in ways that we want to try to capture. And we also have you know, special or specific social and ethical priorities around how we want to try to uh, redress uh, past um, inequities, or we want to take into consideration conditions that are particularly severe um, in certain ways. So we wanna make sure that we have a perspective on that as we talk about value. So this is all in, considered in the ICER report and will be certainly at the heart of our conversation today. The agenda for today starts with this set of opening comments followed by 45 minutes each of a presentation of the comparative clinical evidence summary with questions from the panel and input from clinical experts and patient representatives and 45 minutes of discussion on the cost effectiveness analysis research. Then we will have a 30 minute section of manufacturer comment and comments, and sorry, and discussion back and forth. We'll have public comments and discussion um, following that with lunch at approximately 11.45 Pacific time. Coming back 45 minutes after that to start further deliberation and votes. We'll have a brief break. And then at 1.45 Pacific, that's 4.45 Eastern, we are gonna have a very important policy roundtable discussion. That's going to cover what are we now going to do with the facts on the ground and the reflections on the evidence that we've heard? How do we look forward and think about what's going to happen at the bedside, what's going to happen in the hallways and in the, in the rooms at insurance companies, what's going to happen in the research community, what's gonna happen in the pricing considerations at Biogen and other manufacturers. We're gonna tackle those with a, a distinguished round table uh, group starting at 145 Pacific. We'll have final reflections from members of the CTAF and then be adjourned at, by 4 p.m. Pacific time. You've already been introduced to the clinical and patient experts and thank you again for them uh, being with us. They are part of the meeting from this moment forward. In addition, they will be part of our policy roundtable. And so with that, let me hand it off to Professor Grace Lynn, who is going to uh, lead us through the analysis of the clinical effectiveness information um, that is contained in the ISA report. Grace. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. As Steve said, I'm Grace Lynn. I'm associate professor um, in the Division of General Internal Medicine and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at UCSF. Um, and I was the lead evidence author uh, on this report, uh, along with my um, uh, outstanding team of Patty Sinnott, um, Avery McKenna, and Emily Nan. Um, our disclosures are listed there on the uh, bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. So as Steve has already uh, put into context for us, Alzheimer's disease is a very common and expensive disease. It's the most common cause of dementia in the United States and the fourth leading cause of death. Um, the chart on the left shows the current population of patients with Alzheimer's disease, and this is projected out to 2060. Currently, there are approximately um, 6 million people that are estimated to uh, be affected. Uh, as our population ages, that number of people affected um, will increase, and by 2060, the, the projection is over 13 million people will be affected, with the majority of those being 85 years old and older. Um, there are racial and ethnic differences in the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, with Hispanic Americans and Black Americans one and a half to two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's than white Americans. On the right side of the screen, you'll see a pie chart of estimated direct health care costs. Since av the average life expectancy of a patient with Alzheimer's is between four and eight years, but can be as long as 20 years, depending on their age of onset and their other comorbidities, this population accrues a lot of health care costs. Um, the pie chart shows um, the um, breakdown of cost by payer, not surprisingly, Medicare um, bears the majority of the $355 billion estimated um, direct health care costs, with smaller proportions paid for by Medicaid and commercial insurers, which is the other category. And approximately one-fifth of the costs are estimated to be borne by uh, patients and families themselves. Next slide, slide please. Um, here are the stages and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, here, were, there are five stages, each of which is defined by symptoms and functional impairment. 
Um, the population will focus on um, are the mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease or MCI due to AD um, and the mild Alzheimer's disease population. Um, while memory loss and impaired judgments are hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease and um, start at, at when you have mild, mild cognitive impairment, um, when symptoms start to interfere with everyday activities, such as having language problems, mood swings, and personality changes, this is when the patient gets diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, as, the, um, as patients progress through the disease, um, there are more and greater deficits, ultimately culminating in the loss of the ability to perform their activities of daily living and the need for 24-hour care, either at home or in a long-term care facility. Next slide, please. As you can imagine and may have experienced, Alzheimer's disease has a tremendous impact on patients and caregivers. Uh, patients suffer a loss of independence, which may be manifested early on, for example, by the loss of the ability to drive and manage their own finances, to later in the disease, losing the ability to care for themselves. They may also begin to have personality changes, which has often been described as a loss of self. Um, these changes also result in huge care, a huge caregiver burden. An estimated 15.3 billion hours um, of unpaid caregiving is provided by family and friends. Um, and, and as a result, caregivers can um, suffer both physical and mental um, health issues. They have a greater risk for anxiety, depression, and a poorer quality of life uh, compared with caregivers of uh, people with other um, medical conditions. Women, spouses, and those in lower socioeconomic groups appear to, more, to be more vulnerable to these impacts, and caregivers of those who need an intense amount of supervision were the most likely to experience negative physical health consequences. Next slide, please. The current standard of care for patients with Alzheimer's includes supportive care and non-disease modifying drugs. Um, physical exercise, for example, is associated with some improvements in cognition, um, and care planning and coordination is important to link patients and caregivers with services um, and thinking about and planning for future needs. Some patients may require medication to treat the cognitive and behavioral symptoms of the disease. Um, before the approval of aducanumab uh, in June, the last approval for med a medication to treat Alzheimer's disease was in the early 2000s. Um, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, um, for example, denepazil or Aricept, um, and the NMDA receptor antagonists like memantine um, are the primary treatments for um, these cognitive and behavioral symptoms. Um, also often used are psychotropic drugs, for example, antidepressants and antipsychotics um, as adjuncts to improve neuropsychiatric symptoms of the disease. Next slide, please. Our review examines the clinical and cost effectiveness of adding aducanumab to supportive care in patients with MCI due to Alzheimer's disease or mild Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned on the last slide, supportive care includes non-pharmacologic and non-disease modifying pharmacologic interventions for symptom management. Next slide. In terms of key outcomes, these come from our, our clinical trials. So the primary outcome of the uh, phase three clinical trials was the clinical dementia rating uh, sum of boxes score. Um, this is a scale that assesses three domains of cognition and three domains of function based on interviews with the patients or, and or their caregivers. Scores can range from zero to 18 with higher scores indicating a greater disease severity. Secondary outcomes um, of the trials included cogn other cognitive and functional scales such as the mini, mini mental state exam and the ADAS COG-13 and biomarkers including amyloid and tau um, based on PET scans and uh, CSF, excuse me, cerebral spinal fluid. Next slide, please. Uh, as Steve mentioned, throughout this review, we've engaged in discussions with various patient groups to better understand uh, patient and caregiver experiences with this devastating disease. We learned that some of our, the, our, the main challenges include dependence on others um, and worry about being a burden on others for care and the impact of the disease on mood, emotions, and social life. Um, and the, so the treatment goals are to maintain independence and, and um, identity. 
Um, as I described earlier, caregiving, bur caregiving burden is also substantial um, and increases as uh, the, the disease worsens. Surveys of caregivers show that they spend the equivalent of a second job up to 40 to 60 hours a week on caregiving tasks. There are a number of care gaps that were identified by our patient groups. Um, there is an issue of underdiagnosis. Often uh, patients and physicians don't pursue diagnosis due to the lack of a disease modifying therapy. Um, there's also um, uh, counseling and coordination of care for future planning that doesn't always happen even though uh, Medicare now reimburses uh, for these services. Finally, patient groups discussed some of the limitations of current patient important outcome measures. First, especially in later stages of the disease, measures rely on observations from caregivers, so it's difficult to disentangle um, the patient and the caregiver point of view. Also, the measures focus on cognition and function and not necessarily quality of life um, and uh, aspects of the disease that may be important to patients and caregivers, so may give an incomplete picture of what's really going on. Next slide, please. So with that background, um, let's turn to the evidence. Um, the history of disease modifying therapies for Alzheimer's disease um, has been filled with fail failed therapies and aducanumab is the first disease modifying drug to be approved by the FDA. But the story of aducanumab's path to approval, uh, as you all, all know, was not smooth. Um, starting from promising phase 1b trials to phase 3 trials that were stopped for futility, some subsequent reanalysis of the data that found uh, possible effect of the drug, and controversy at the FDA advisory committee meeting um, back in November of 2020. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'll go through some of the data from the aducanumab trials and try to address some of the questions about the data that have been debated by the FDA, clinical experts, and um, that you may have heard about um, in the media. Um, so our two phase three clinical trials are uh, ENGAGE and EMERGE. Um, these were contemporaneous, identically designed, randomized clinical trials. Um, they each enrolled about 1,600 patients with MCI or mild Alzheimer's um, with confirmed amyloid pathology via PET scan. Um, the majority of the patients um, had the apolipoprotein E4 gene, or you'll hear me refer to that as APOE, um, which reflects the general um, Alzheimer's disease population where the majority of the, the population has uh, is positive for apolipoprotein E4. About 80% of the patients in the trials were in, diagnosed with MCI, and the average age was around 70 years old, um, which if you recall from uh, my, uh, one of my earlier slides, the uh, average age in the United States tends to be a bit older. Um, the trial follow-up was planned to be 18 months with an interim pre-specified futility analysis scheduled with data collected until December of 2018. Now, next slide, please. This is an important slide. This is where um, we're going to describe um, the dosing regimens in the trials. Patients were randomized one to one to one to placebo, a low dose of aducanumab, or a high dose of aducanumab. The dosing um, was stratified by APOE status. For patients who, without APOE4 gene or APOE negative patients, the low dose uh, was six milligrams per kilogram and the high dose was 10 milligrams per kilogram. For APOE positive patients, because of a heightened risk of swelling in the brain that was seen in earlier anti-amyloid trial, antibody trials, dosing was lower. The low dose was three milligrams per kilogram and the high dose was six milligrams per kilogram. Um, at the beginning of the trial. Um, notice that the APOE negative group remained at 10 milligrams um, uh, per kilogram throughout the study. This is gonna be um, something important to remember as we go through the data. Subsequent data demonstrated that APOE positive patients could be safely titrated up to 10 milligrams per kilogram. And so in a protocol amendment in March of 2017, which will, we call, which is called protocol version four, and you'll hear that, um, throughout the presentation, um, patients in the APOE positive high dose group were allowed to be titrated up to 10 milligrams per kilogram. All other groups remain the same. Enrollment in both studies was completed in July of 2018. And so the, the, the futility analysis was planned for um, December, 2018. Um, as you know, the initial results from the futility analysis um, were, showed that both trials were 
not likely to meet their primary outcome, which was a statistically significant change in CDRSB, and so the trials were discontinued at that point. Um, however, additional data subsequently became available and the manufacturer did analyses with a larger data set, and which I'll share some results um, with you right now. Next slide, please. So here on this slide, we have the change in amyloid as measured by um, PET scanning um, in both trials. Uh, the engage is on the left and emerge is on the right. Um, the blue line is placebo, the orange line is low dose, and the gray line is high dose arm in each graph. Um, you can see here in both trials, the drug was very effective at removing amyloid from the brain um, with the largest amount of amyloid removed in the high dose arm. Um, one thing we should remember, though, is that um, amyloid is a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease, and while it's correlated with the development of the disease, um, the correlation with clinical improvement isn't 100% clear. Next slide, please. So in terms of clinical outcomes, um, the CDRSB at 78 weeks was the primary endpoint in both studies. And remember in this, uh, for CDRSB, lower is better. It represents slower decline. So we're looking for uh, lower numbers. In eMERGE, and we'll focus on the intention to treat analysis, the CDRSB was 0 0.39 points lower in the high dose group, which is represented by the red line versus placebo, um, which is um, recommend, or represented by the black line. And this was statistically significant and represented a 22% decrease um, compared with placebo. However, you note, you'll note in this graph that the curves did not really separate until that 78 week time point. Next slide, please. And so then we have ENGAGE, um, its sister study. And again, this is the intention to treat analysis. And you can see here that at 78 weeks, there was no statistically significant difference between the groups. The groups don't really um, diverge much. And in fact, the high dose group, which is that red line again, um, actually did a bit worse than placebo. Um, in both studies, the secondary endpoints, um, as I mentioned, that those were other cognitive and functional outcomes like mini mental state exam and ADAS COG went in the same direction as the primary endpoint. That is to say, they trended towards improvement in engage, emerge and no benefit in engage. Next slide, please. In terms of the harms, the main harm is the so called amyloid related imaging abnormalities or ARIA. Um, these are changes in the brain seen on MRI and come up in two varieties brain swelling, or ARIA-E, and brain hemorrhage, or ARIA-H. Um, symptoms of ARIA include headache, confusion, and dizziness. 41% uh, of patients in the aducanumab high-dose group, that's the 10 milligram per kilogram group, experienced ARIA. Most cases were asymptomatic or mild um, and resolved on their own, but severe cases did occur. Um, in the trial, those with no or mild symptoms were able to continue on the drug without interruption, but anyone with moderate or severe symptoms had interruption in treatment. If the ARIA resolved, they were um, allowed to, to continue treatment. Um, if the ARIA did not resolve, they were discontinued for treatment. Um, most did end up resolving. Um, the main risk factor for ARIA um, appears to be APOE status. Patients who are APOE positive are more likely to develop ARIA. That was why there was a difference in dosing in the first place. 9% of patients um, in the trials discontinued aducanumab. Uh, and the other harms besides ARIA that were seen were headache, falls, and diarrhea. Next slide, please. So that was a, a, a brief summary of the data. Um, so let's tackle some of the controversies surrounding this drug. That's, that is, why did ENGAGE and EMERGE show different results? Next slide. So here's what we know. These were identically designed trials that ran in parallel. Next. Um, next, the trial populations had similar baseline characteristics, um, and, that, the, and they were stopped at the same time based on predicted futility. Um, two questions that came up for us um, during our review were whether it's a fair assumption that the eMERGE results um, were the correct ones and the ENGAGE results were wrong, that is, um, that ENGAGE was a false negative instead of eMERGE being a false positive, um, and whether it was appropriate to do post hoc subgroup analyses to try to explain the results. Let's dive into these questions. Next slide. Um, so 
One hypothesis is that you need full dosing, which is defined as 10 consistent doses of 10 milligrams per kilogram to see an effect. Um, Engage started about one month before eMERGE, which meant that fewer patients were affected by the protocol amendment that increased the dosing in the APOE um, group, positive group. Um, the protocol version four influenced 56% um, in eMERGE and 49% in Engage. Um, and so patients who received all 14 doses of the 10 milligram per kilogram dose um, was slightly different, slightly more in eMERGE than Engage. Um, so can that explain the results? Next slide, please. This figure shows the percent difference in CDRSB for the high dose arm compared to a propensity matched placebo group. Um, so again, this was a post hoc analysis. So um, we've lost randomization here. So what, what they've done is they've matched um, the intervention group with pa patients with placebo who are similar. The yellow bar represents um, the percent difference in CDRSB in patients who received at least six doses of the 10 milligram uh, per kilogram dose. Green represents um, those who received at least um, uh, 10 doses and so on until the purple um, bar, which are patients who received more than 14 doses of the drug. And you'll see on the left side is engage um, the, with the higher number of doses and the greater uh, translated to a greater effect. However, on the right side, and emerge, you can see that the relationship doesn't seem to be present, that um, the, um, the number of doses um, doesn't have a great impact on the difference in CDRSB in eMERGE. Next slide, please. Um, let's look at the, those results by dose in another way. Um, let's play the game, name that dose. So, um, here are four graphs, um, each showing CDRSB scores in the post-protocol four population. So this is after the protocol amendment, and this is stratified by APOE status. Um, I'd like the CTAF members to turn to the last page of your evidence summary, and there you'll find a copy of this slide. Um, please take a moment to guess which graph is, uh, is the eMERGE APOE positive group, which one's the eMERGE APOE negative group, which is engage APOE positive, which is engage APOE negative, and then see if you can figure out um, whether um, you can uh, see which are the high, uh, medium, and low dose um, groups in there. So I'll give you a moment to do that. Okay, well, so let's let me um, share with you um, the results. So, in the top left hand corner, um, we have the Engage APOE group. And you can see here that the dots generally follow what you'd expect if dosing mattered, that the high dose did better than low dose and placebo. Um, recall that in the APOE negative group, the high dose got a consistent 10 milligram per kilogram dose throughout the trial. Um, and so, this is Engage, this was a negative trial. Now, if we look at eMERGE, which is a positive trial, um, again, this is the APOE negative group, and we can see here that there is very little difference between the groups, and um, the placebo group actually is the had the um, uh, best um, uh, um, result in this group with um, doing better than high dose and low dose. So not exactly what you would expect. Um, for APOE patients in engage APOE positive patients. Next slide, please. You can see again, the high dose group does better than the low dose um, as you might expect. And then for the eMERGE APOE positive group, when we look at this again, you'll see that the labels don't follow that order and that um, the low dose group in this trial actually did better than the high dose group. So based on these four graphs, it's not clear that dosing is the main driver of uh, differing results. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, the assumption was that eMERGE, um, the positive trial is correct, um, and that ENGAGE is a uh, false negative trial. But if you take into, con into context prior amyloid trials, you could see how that uh, assumption could be called into question. So what we have here is a forest plot 
of the pooled estimated effects of amyloid reduction on mini mental state exam. Um, this was published in the uh, British Medical Journal um, just this past year. And you can see um, on the graph that all of the um, trials were non-significant with the confidence intervals crossing that center line. Um, and at the bottom, you'll see in the red box, um, the aducanumab uh, trials, which follows a similar pattern. And in fact, when you pull all the trials um, with that bottom red square, um, the, you see that um, the published antibody data results in the um, uh, results in potential harm, actually, um, it may, uh, that it results that amyloid reduction may be harmful, um, in fact, rather than helpful. Um, so really, although again, the results were not significant. So really it's uh, the prior amyloid trials um, really don't show any effect of amyloid reduction on clinical outcomes, at least for this uh, mini mental state exam. Next slide, please. Um, so why might aducanumab have shown positive results then when others did not? Um, one reason um, that was uh, brought forth by um, the manufacturer was that aducanumab targets aggregated forms of amyloid, um, which are, is different from some of the an other anti-amyloid drugs. Um, it specifically ta targets an oligomer of amyloid, and there is some thought that the oligomer could be the toxic form. Um, as we saw in a, an earlier slide, uh, aducanumab was very effective at removing amyloid. Next. Um, Furthermore, there were some differences in the trial design from earlier clinical trials. Um, emerge and engage recruited patients earlier in the disease course and who had confirmed amyloid pathology by PET scan, which previous trials had not been able to do. And they were able to use the dose titration to decrease the risk of aria. Um, However, amyloid plaques accrue in the brain decades earlier than symptoms start to occur. Um, and um, some of our experts have, have told us that um, the damage uh, has, some of the damage has likely already been done and may not be reversible by that time, um, by the time symptoms appear. So in thinking about the pathophysiology of the disease, it's not clear that removal, removal of amyloid at the MCI or mild Alzheimer's disease stages would necessarily um, be helpful in changing the course of the disease. Next slide, please. Um, this slide sums up our concerns um, about the data and the results. Um, so there's some methodologic concerns. We're concerned that, um, that there's inconsistent results between the two identical trials, um, that the um, analyses that showed positive results were post hoc analyses, um, at, which are usually exploratory in nature because they break randomization. And thus there may be some unobserved factors that influence the results. Um, additionally, there's a small concern that there may have been functional unblinding of the groups due to ARIA since patients um, had more intense monitoring and treatment stoppages um, if ARIA occurred, although the data that we've reviewed suggests that this isn't a major factor. We're also concerned about the clinical significance of the results. Um, there isn't a widely accepted minimal clinically important difference for CDRSB. Um, in the literature, some have suggested that one to three points is clinically significant. If that's true, then the 0.39 absolute difference in CDRSB scores um, in the eMERGE study are likely too small to be clinically relevant. This was um, uh, confirmed by our clinical experts. Um, they also mentioned that there's an uncertain link between amyloid reduction and clinical efficacy, as I mentioned um, previously. In terms of safety, we know that um, note that there's, there was intense monitoring of patients in the clinical trial for ARIA that won't be required in the real world. Um, in the trials, participants had a total of seven MRIs during the trial, um, but only three MRIs are required by the label. Um, we're concerned that cases of, of ARIA may be missed or that cases may be more severe because of the decreased amount of monitoring. Um, finally, there's some questions about generalizability. Uh, there are no data uh, for this drug in the moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease population. And there was also a lack of racial and ethnic diversity in the trial. Um, and as I mentioned, the trial population was on the young side um, compared to the general U.S. population with um, Alzheimer's. And so this um, calls into question whether, how generalizable these um, results may be in the U.S. population. Next slide, please. 
Um, there's some other potential benefits and contextual considerations that we took into consideration in reviewing the data. Um, mainly that there is a very high unmet need for effective disease modifying therapy um, for, uh, and that the disease has a major impact on patient and caregivers' lives and their quality of life. Um, the drug is delivered as an IV infusion every four weeks, um, plus the uh, MRI monitoring that's required. Um, and this may be burdensome to, to patients, particularly for a population that may have more difficulty traveling to appointments. Um, the impact uh, that the drug may have on health inequities is unclear, um, as is the impact on long-term long care need in this population. Next slide, please. Um, so what I've reviewed with you so far is what we presented in our evidence report. We received some public comments after the release of the draft report, report uh, um, including that the harm from ARIA is not severe since most of the cases are asymptomatic and or resolved. However, severe cases do occur, and it's not clear that there, um, whether or not there may be more severe or symptomatic cases outside of the careful monitoring of the clinical trial. Um, this drug is the first in its class to be approved um, for Alzheimer's um, and the first to show potential efficacy, and that shouldn't be discounted as a springboard for further innovation. But I will point out that prior trials of anti-amyloid antibodies, as I showed you um, earlier, did not show any clinical um, efficacy. This treatment um, could have some value in reducing health disparities related to diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease, um, especially since Black and Hispanic Americans are at higher risk and bear a disproportionate burden of disease. But that improvement would only be seen um, with an effective treatment. Um, ineffective treatments might actually worsen disparities. Next slide, please. So just to sum up, um, hopefully I've showed you that uh, eMERGE uh, met its primary endpoint and ENGAGE did not in the intention to treat analysis. Some post hoc analyses were more supportive of positive results, but concerns remain about the validity of such analyses um, and the possibility that eMERGE was the chance finding and not ENGAGE. Um, ARIA is a concern. While it was mostly mild, it was common, and there are severe cases. And again, um, the clinical significance um, of the change in CDRSB is, is unclear. Next slide. All of this leads us to conclude that there is low certainty that aducanumab will provide clinical benefit. Um, we also know that harm can occur as patients on aducanumab, some of them will develop symptomatic ARIA. Um, and as a result, we um, have an, uh, had an evidence rating of insufficient uh, for the net health, health benefit of aducanumab compared with supportive care um, for the treatment of MCI and mild Alzheimer's disease. So that concludes um, my review of the clinical evidence. Um, and now I'll, I'll pause for uh, questions or clarifications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lin, for that. Um, outstanding presentation and review of the clinical studies and the evidence. We have about 10 minutes budgeted for questions. Questions could be asked by CTAP panel members, by our patients, um, or our clinical experts. Please use your raise hand function, and I will call on you. Elizabeth Murphy. Thanks for that excellent um, review. Um, one of the things I noticed when you were looking at the um, change in CDRSB graphs was the, kind of the depressing thing of how big a change there was from baseline. And I just wanted to make sure, you know, that I was seeing that right, that the change from baseline in all groups, whether or not they were on any treatment, was far greater than any change or potential change by the drug effect. And I assume that was all significant, that patients, patients were just worsening. Yes, that's correct. Um, and uh, in the economic review, um, I think Melanie will will um, talk about the um, hazard ratio of, of how, how many people transitioned between MCI and mild Alzheimer's because people did transition and progress through the disease throughout the clinical trials. Okay, uh, Annette Langer-Gould. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Lin, for that great um, summary of the evidence. Can you talk a little bit more, because the trials were stopped early, when we talk about ARIA occurring in about 40% of people, is that over 
yeah, how many people completed the 18 months of follow-up and then how many people completed significantly less um, time? That's a great question. So, um, sorry, let me pull up. Um, so the, the question of ARIA uh, is interesting and the, the development of ARIA is interesting because um, a lot of it occurs um, early on in the disease. So about 25% of the patients developed ARIA within the first six months. Um, and this is uh, significant because um, in the FDA labeling, there's uh, the requirement is a baseline MRI and then not another MRI until uh, the six month mark, I believe. Um, so a, a, a certainly a proportion of people will develop ARIA bef um, before they get that next MRI or they're required to get that next MRI. In terms of the numbers of people that, um, uh, that completed the trials versus the number of people um, uh, who um, were not able to complete the the trials. I'm trying to pull up. I'm sorry, I don't have that number off the top of my head. I'm trying to pull that up. Um, Patty, um, I'm just going to ask my colleague, Patty Sinnott. Patty, do you have that um, at hand? I'm just pulling it up now. Okay. One of us will get that number. Um, but it was, um, it, you know, uh, I believe um, it was um, 60%. 50, 50 to 60%, I believe, um, somewhere in the neighborhood, 50 per, to 60%, but we'll get that exact number for you that completed um, the trial. And then I had one other question. Um, you know, typically drug companies will do sort of um, open label extension trials. And I'm wondering whether they um, have present, have they shown any data that um, ARIA may have a delayed effect on cognitive decline? So one of the concerns and other neurological diseases, stroke and multiple sclerosis, is that people can take sort of big hits to be relatively asymptomatic in terms of lesions or make a great recovery from that stroke, but then the dementia or cognitive decline kicks in a few years later, whether we have any information on potential long-term harm of ARIA. Yes, that's a good question. No, we do, do not. The open label extension, which is called Embark, is um, is now ongoing and it's not scheduled to be completed, I believe, until 2023 or 2024. So we don't really have that long-term data as of yet. Let's turn it over to Ralph for a question. Uh, thanks. Uh, great presentation, uh, Grace. I have a question related to safety. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding in both trials uh, patients who were excluded if they were on anticoagulants. And my understanding, yes. certainly in this age group, a substantial pa number of patients might be needed to be on anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation or valvular disease or other indications. So I'm uh, concerned about the interaction of anticoagulants uh, and this drug. Since again, my understanding is FDA did not say uh, you did not need to be on anticoagulants to be on uh, prescribe this drug. <clears throat> so my question is, do we have any data on the safety or the uh, uh, onset of aria or brain hemorrhage in patients on this drug who are on anticoagulants? That's a great question, um, Ralph. We don't have any detailed data on that. Um, all we have are the overall safety data, um, which reports that um, I think approximately 10 or 12 percent um, of the the um, aria um, was aria the hemorrhage type aria H. Um, and as you mentioned, you know the the patients with anticoagulants were excluded from the trial. And I don't know, um, I don't have data on whether or not any pa patients were started on anticoagulation during the trial. That would be important information, I think, um, as we go forward to, to find out. Uh, let's turn a question over to Bob Collier. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, uh, was, was the main difference between these trials just that they were at different sites because it's, it's clearly supposed to be the same protocol? And the different sites would explain the slight the month, month difference in timing. The other thing that I want to be totally clear on is the primary endpoint was CDR, not reduction in amyloid, correct? Yes. So the, uh, the answer to your latter question is yes. The, their, their main primary endpoint was CDR. Um, the reduction in amyloid was a secondary endpoint. And as um, I think someone pointed out uh, in the chat that it was uh, it was actually a small substudy um, of the trial that had the 
uh, pet amyloid done um, for that study. Um, and, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt again, but that's, but, that's one of my questions. It, uh, reduction in amyloid was spelled out as a secondary endpoint in the protocol? It, it was spelled out, yes. Protocol or one of the, one of the updates? Uh, that was in the original protocol, I believe. Um, and the, in terms of, yes, the, the trials were done in different sites and uh, started at slightly different time points a month apart. Um, and the, those, were the, those were the main differences in the trials. Okay, let's take a question from Say Lee and then maybe one more after that. Uh, Grace, uh, a great presentation. Uh, one question that I think would help me and, and other clinicians and, and maybe even kind of uh, um, others advocates um, get, is get, uh, hear a little more about what some of the more severe adverse effects of ARIA, clinical adverse effects of ARIA may be. Um, it sounds like the majority were asymptomatic, but of the ones that were not asymptomatic, one of the things that I worry about is certainly in caring for patients with Alzheimer's who may get uh, agitation, oftentimes this can lead to kind of this cascade of um, difficult choices of do we prescribe other medications to try to control the agitation, uh, which themselves can have risks. And so I'm wondering if we can get a little um, additional data on some of the symptomatic uh, aria and so uh, to get a better handle on the magnitude of harms. Yeah, that's a great question, Say. Um, we don't have a lot of data um, um, in terms of what we do have is um, 40, about 46% uh, of patients had headache, 14% um, had confusion, and 10% had dizziness. Um, there were 13 participants um, were, who were reported to have serious um, ARIA-E, um, and approximately 69% um, uh, of them uh, resolved within 12 weeks um, of all ARIA. Um, so I, I, I think the, um, uh, I don't have any information on, for example, hospitalizations or changes in medication or anything like that that was um, uh, reported um, to us and that we reviewed. So um, I don't, I unfortunately don't have that information in terms of how severe the severe group was. Um, there was, I think, one reported death or a couple reported deaths in the phase 1B trial. Um, uh, and that, I think, was the most severe, obviously, the most severe adverse event. I would say we have time for, I'm sorry, maybe one more. So, Elizabeth Murphy, I think if you have a, a brief question. Yeah, I'll just be, and this has kind of already been alluded to, but you're talking about uh, death as one of the severe outcomes. And I assume the other things are neurologic deficits that are permanent. Could you have some other examples of what's defined as severe, just so we have a sense of how impaired patients may be by this? Yeah, let me just, sorry, I, um, let me just pull up um, the data that we did have. I mean, what we, what we have that was reported by the manufacturer, so we don't have um, this, these, uh, these uh, reports uh, the, uh, so far have not yet been published. So we don't have any published data um, except for case reports. And um, so let's see, um, uh, I'm, I'll just uh, report uh, one of the case reports. Um, and basically um, the symptoms included headache and encephalopathy, um, uh, uh, in the trial, uh, this was someone who had aducanumab um, in the trial um, and ended up with encephalopathy as, as the most severe form. Um, so for example, that's, uh, that was uh, one report of a very severe case. Well, as always, um, our CTAF members have really outstanding questions. I'm sorry to um, not get to all of them, but trying to keep us on time. I'm gonna pass it back to Grace Lynn for you to introduce Dr. Whittington. Thank you, um, Dr. Fox. Um, next, uh, Dr. Melanie Whittington um, will present um, the long-term cost-effectiveness uh, modeling that the ICER team did related to aducanumab. Mel? Thanks, Grace. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mel Whittington. I'm the Associate Director of Health Economics at ACER, um, and I'll be presenting chapter four of our report, which is the long-term cost effectiveness of aducanumab. 
And before I get started, you might um, all be questioning, and uh, certainly many public commenters did, how can you conduct a cost effectiveness analysis when, um, when on the slide before you're saying the evidence is insufficient? And it's, it's a very good question. It's a question we've spent um, many months pondering. Um, and if you believe um, engage is truth, if you think that is a true story, then you don't need to listen for the next 45 minutes. You don't need an economic model if you don't believe there's any, um, <clears throat> any possibility for a clinical benefit. There would be no price aligned with value. But if you're uncertain what the effectiveness might be, if you believe emerge is truth or you, engage, or you believe it's somewhere in between engage and emerge, you might be wondering what you do. And what you do is you build a model with evidence-based assumptions. And so that is what we did. And I'll spend quite a bit of time detailing what those evidence-based assumptions are um, so you, you fully understand the approach that we took to this analysis. Next slide. Before I get too far, I want to acknowledge um, two individuals in particular, Dr. John Campbell and Noemi Fluch. They are um, key members of our economic team here at ICER, as well as this review. Next slide. The objective of this portion of the review is to estimate the cost effectiveness of aducanumab in addition to supportive care as compared to supportive care alone. And supportive care can include non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic, but non-disease modifying therapies. Next slide. This says methods in brief, but I'm not, I'm not going to be all that brief in the methods because again, this is very important to understand the methods and the evidence-based assumptions we made given the insufficiencies in the evidence. Next slide. So let's start with population. Our population that started our economic evaluation and thus were assumed to initiate aducanumab treatment were individuals um, restricted to early Alzheimer's disease. So this was defined as mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease or mild Alzheimer's disease. And this was in alignment with the clinical evidence and the updated FDA label. The table on this slide shows um, patient characteristics, including the mean age was 70, which aligned with the trial population. This influences baseline mortality and utility. The percent female was 52%, also in alignment with the trials. Um, and this influences baseline mortality. The clinical stage at, at baseline was 55% MCI and 45% mild Alzheimer's disease. And these estimates are from population level estimates um, and ideally represent the, that mix of individuals who we believe might initiate this treatment. The setting of care was also tracked in this model. Um, and in our model, 8% started in long-term care. Next slide. The model that we made was a Markov model, which I'll show a schematic on the next slide. Um, but our setting was the United States and our perspective was actually a co-based case perspective where we had a healthcare system perspective and a modified societal perspective. The healthcare system perspective focused on the direct medical costs and health outcomes of the patient. And then in the modified societal perspective, we also included patient productivity, caregiver quality of life, caregiver time spent caregiving, and caregiver direct medical costs. And we have presented these as a co-based case analysis. Now, if you've seen our report, you may notice that our incremental cost effectiveness ratios and our incremental findings between these two perspectives don't differ that much. Um, and that's because these are incremental findings and are driven by um, a relatively small effectiveness of aducanumab. We have included these as a co-based case analysis because we understand through our lived experiences, our engagement with patients, caregivers, and patient advocacy groups, the enormity of these costs for the societal perspective. And so it was important for us to keep these as co-based case analyses, um, although the effectiveness of aducanumab didn't differ the, the incremental findings between these two perspectives. Our time horizon is that of a lifetime. And so although we start our population in early Alzheimer's disease, we do follow this population over a lifetime time horizon and therefore track them among higher um, levels of severity of disease. All future costs and outcomes are discounted at 3% per year and our cycle length is an annual cycle to align with the evidence and other economic models in the space. Our primary outcomes was the cost for quality adjusted life year gained cost for equal value of life year gained, 
cost per life year gained, and cost per year in the community gained. The cost per equal value of life year gained, if you aren't familiar with this metric, this is a metric that for any period of life extension, it assigns the same um, utility score, essentially that of, of uh, average of the general population. So in an upcoming slide, I'll show disutilities assigned specific to Alzheimer's disease. And this outcome, those were not assigned in that period of life extension. And then the cost per year in the community gain, this is something we heard as very important from the patient advocacy groups and patients we talked to at the beginning of this review, how important it is to individuals to stay in the community and outside of long-term care. And so we have concluded, included that as a separate outcome. Next slide. Here's our model schematic. This is a typical model schematic of a Markov model. You see five ovals. These represent our health states that are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Um, so an individual is within one of these at any given time. You'll see we have a health state for MCI, mild Alzheimer's disease, moderate Alzheimer's disease, and severe Alzheimer's disease. We also have a health state that represents death. There are numerous arrows on this model schematic to show the um, flexibility and structure that the model allows. You'll see there are some bi-directional arrows. So you'll see there's an arrow from severe Alzheimer's disease to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so the, the model structure is advanced enough to allow for those, um, what you might think are backward transitions, although those were quite infrequent in the evidence. In addition to severity of Alzheimer's disease, our model tracks the severity of care. So a community dwelling versus long-term care dwelling. And we assumed once patients progressed to long-term care, they stayed there until death. And this model schematic is set up um, in alignment with what we heard from patients in that what really matters to them is clinical benefit and reducing the severity of the disease. And so reducing progressions to more severe levels of Alzheimer's disease um, and to long-term care is what's driving our findings here. Next slide. Key model assumptions. Um, we're gonna spend some time on this slide because this is where it's really important for us all to understand what the model assumed in order to interpret our results. And really the key model assumptions are those assumptions that we made for the aducanumab treatment effectiveness given the uncertainty and the insufficiency in the evidence. So the first bullet, what did we assume for the aducanumab effectiveness for transitions out of mild cognitive impairment? And so assumption one is, did we assume a benefit? And the answer to that is yes. We assumed that aducanumab did um, slow the progression out of MCI. And so then the second assumption is, well, how much? And what we did there is we took a blend of the um, um, treatment effectiveness from the two trials, engage and emerge. And so we don't know which is truth, engage or emerge. And so our assumption was let's blend them. Let's take this pooled estimate between the two. It is worth noting, this might be assumption three on this bullet, is um, what's, what, given the model schematic is focused on transitions of severity of care, the input that we really need for the model is a hazard ratio on transitions out of MCI. And Biogen provided that to us for the eMERGE study. They did not provide us that for the ENGAGE study. And so we relied on um, the relationship with the CDR sum of boxes that Grace provided. So the second bullet is on the effect on disease progression for mild. I'm going to skip that for just a second uh, and skip to the third bullet, which is the effect on the disease progression for moderate. So in MCI, we're assuming, okay, we're assuming this is going to work and it's this blend of ENGAGE and EMERGE. In moderate, through calls with stakeholders, um, it was not believed that aducanumab would reduce the disease progression from moderate Alzheimer's disease. And so we assumed the same thing. We assumed a hazard ratio of one, that it doesn't reduce the disease progression from moderate Alzheimer's disease. It is worth noting, we didn't assume that it could increase the rate of disease progression in moderate. So we didn't assume that there's this catch-up period that occurred um, once an individual reached moderate Alzheimer's disease. We simply assumed a hazard ratio of one. So now let's go back to the second bullet. And the second bullet is what is the aducanumab effectiveness on mild? This we did not have evidence for transitions from mild to moderate or severe Alzheimer's disease. So we took this, we took kind of pieces of information from bullets one and three, where M MCI, we assumed this blend 
um, of engage and emerge, that is a hazard ratio less than one. And then for moderate, we assumed it didn't work and was a hazard ratio of one. So for mild, we didn't have evidence on transitions here. So our evidence-based assumption is that it would be in between. That it was fit that aducanumab is 50% less effective on transitions out of mild as it was on MCI. And so for example, if um, the MCI hazard ratio was 0.8 and then moderate was one, and mild, we would assume 0.9. So we did that midpoint between those two numbers. All right, now to the fourth bullet here um, is another key model assumption, and that is that patients stop receiving aducanumab once they enter the severe Alzheimer's disease health state. Now these are key model assumptions. These have been tested extensively in sensitivity and scenario analyses. In my talk today, I will present an optimistic and conservative treatment benefit scenario that varies the first three bullets on this slide. And then in our report, um, there is a scenario that varies the last assumption as well. Next slide. Here are key model inputs, clinical inputs. I've touched on most of these on the previous slide, um, but just to reiterate this one more time, for the aducanumab hazard ratio for transitions out of mild cognitive impairment, we assumed this blend of uh, the ENGAGE and the EMERGE trial. For the ENGAGE trial, we didn't have the hazard ratio. And so we used that um, relationship that, that Grace provided on um, the change in CDR sum of boxes. So on her slide, it was that plus 2%, 2% and actually the, the, the wrong direction as to what we might expect. And so we've converted that to a hazard ratio of 1.02. And then we blended that with the hazard ratio that Biogen provided to us from the eMERGE trial that's currently academic and confidence. And then the third row in this table is the hazard educating map hazard ratio from moderate. That's where we again assumed a hazard ratio of one. And then for mild, the second row in this table, we took that midpoint. So it was 50% as effective as a hazard ratio from MCI. Other key clinical inputs to emphasize um, are the safety inputs, ARIA. So the probability of symptomatic ARIA um, in the model was 10%, which was also the amount of discontinuation due to adverse events. <laughs> we did assume that ARIA occurred within the first 18 months of starting aducanumab. Um, and although this slide presents the 10% discontinuation due to adverse events, yes, that did occur in the first 18 months, but discontinuation then occurred every single cycle over the lifetime time horizon due to pa patients transitioning to severe Alzheimer's disease. The average duration of ARIA was 12 weeks, which is important for um, how disutilities and monitoring costs were assigned. Next slide. Here are our utility inputs. You'll see the patient disutilities at the top part of this table with the caregiver disutilities that come into play in our modified societal perspective at the bottom portion of this table. Um, I know there's a lot of numbers here, and so I'm just going to point you to um, a few key takeaways on this. First is that caregiver, or that disutilities um, worsen along with disease severity. And so you'll see, looking at the patient disutilities for MCI, we have a disutility of minus 0.17. This increases dramatically um, to severe Alzheimer's disease of minus 0 0.53. You'll also see a typical worsening as a patient goes to long-term care, as represented by a larger disutility. It is important to note that these values for disutilities are a measure of central tendency. And so this isn't saying everyone with severe Alzheimer's disease is minus 0 0.53 disutility. Um, th of course, everything has a range, but this is, is one midpoint that's used. Our care caregiver disutilities on the bottom portion of the slide um, was challenging in the literature. It is something that I'm sure we'll have a conversation on today, and it's something I would like to see in, in research and literature going forward is more work in this space because there's a lot of literature that suggests that caregiver disutility does not differ by Alzheimer's disease severity. Now, this was something, again, through our experiences and engagement um, uh, with patient advocacy groups and patients that we just couldn't reconcile. And so we did find literature to be able to um, reflect this increase in disutility with Alzheimer's disease severity. Next slide. Cost inputs for aducanumab, we assumed $56,000 per year plus the 6% um, markup related to infusion. 
A few things to note here, the year one cost would be lower due to the titration that's characteristic of aducanumab over the first year. Another thing to note here is that this is based as a weight-based dose. And so this price is representative of, of kind of the average weight of a patient with Alzheimer's disease of around 74,000. There are two vial sizes here. I believe it's 300 milligrams and 170 milligrams. And so individuals um, with a lower weight will likely still need three vials to, um, to receive their full dose. Individuals on a higher weight might need to receive four vials, which would be a price above 56,000. We assume a, a, a price for brain MRIs. Brain MRIs factor into the model in two places. There are three brain MRIs in the first year to align with the FDA label, as well as three brain MRIs for each ARIA occurrence. The last row on this table is caregiver time spent caregiving. This comes into play in our modified societal perspective. And you can see the enormity of these costs across all disease stages, but how they dramatically increase um, as Alzheimer's disease severity increases. These values estimates are um, presented here are monthly and they were monetized in the modified societal perspective. These values are also for community dwelling patients. Um, the time spent for long-term care dwelling patients is, is 44% of these values. Next slide. All right, let's get into the results. Next slide. This slide presents the undiscounted years in the health states. Um, and so our columns represent aducanumab, um, and then our last column is support of care alone, and our rows are each health state. And so you'll see that aducanumab in our model, um, those who received aducanumab in addition to supportive care spent more time in MCI and mild Alzheimer's disease. In MCI, this translates to approximately three months. In mild, this translates to approximately one month. And so there are around four more months um, in earlier stages of Alzheimer's disease, which does uh, coincide well with some of the um, public statements with, within the range of time, time expected to be um, in earlier health states. Next slide. Here are our model inputs. The first half of this table represents the healthcare system perspective, and the bottom half of this table represents the societal perspective. The total cost increase in the aducanumab arm um, is difference or incremental results, aducanumab versus supportive care over the lifetime time horizon was $204,000, where the vast majority of this is represented by aducanumab costs. You'll see in the societal perspective, you see how much larger the costs are per arm. So in aducanumab, it was $546,000. This increases to $880,000. 838,000 in the societal perspective. So this is capturing the enormity of these costs, but the incremental findings in this um, are not that different. 204,000 um, in the healthcare system perspective, 202,000 in the societal perspective. So there are cost offsets that are captured here. And the reason why the societal perspective is lower is because um, in our model, aducanumab does have more, uh, those treated with aducanumab have more time in MCI and mild Alzheimer's disease, which is associated with less time spent caregiving. So those cost offsets are there. They're just not large due to the minimum, um, minimal effectiveness. <clears throat> the incremental qualities gained, equal value of life years gained, and life years are also presented in bulls. These are relatively small. Um, and again, the societal perspective slightly higher than the healthcare system perspective. And that's driven by there is some additional time in the lower levels of Alzheimer's disease severity. And so that transfers to um, a few quality gains and a few cost offsets. The life years and community outcome is also presented. Next slide. Here are our incremental cost effectiveness ratios. Again, the top portion of this table is the healthcare system perspective and the bottom portion of this table is the societal perspective. In the healthcare, pers healthcare system perspective, um, there was a cost per quality gained of 1.33 million per quality gained and a 1.02 million cost per equal value of life year gained. A societal perspective has uh, ever so slightly more favorable incremental cost effectiveness ratios of 1.27 million for the cost per quality gained and 938,000 for the cost per equal value of life year gained. Next. 
We conducted numerous sensitivity and scenario analyses. The one-way sensitivity analysis um, with the full tornado diagram is available in the report, but it's clear from that, that tornado diagram, there's one input that really influences cost effectiveness findings, and that is the agitating about treatment effectiveness. Um, varying that input alone resulted in incremental cost effectiveness ratios that ranged from dominated, so more costly, less effective, this is kind of the engaged world, to approximately $600,000 per quality gained. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Here are the results from our probabilistic sensitivity analysis. This varies all of the parameters at once. Um, and zero of the iterations were beneath a threshold of $200,000 per quality gain or per EVOYG. Next slide. Our scenario analyses are, are, are it will highlight two, one being an optimistic treatment benefit scenario and the second being a conservative treatment benefit scenario. And I'll talk through the differences um, when I'm showing the results. Next slide. So here is our optimistic treatment benefit scenario. This differs from our base case in two ways. The first is that we are saying eMERGE was truth. We are no longer going to blend the eMERGE hazard ratio with the engaged hazard ratio for transitions from MCI. So we're assuming that um, eMERGE hazard ratio for transitions from MCI. So that's difference one. Difference two is that for transitions from mild, instead of assuming it's 50% effective, we're going to assume it's 100% as effective. So essentially in this optimistic treatment benefit scenario, we're taking that hazard ratio from eMERGE and applying it to transitions from MCI and from mild. And that produces um, co incremental cost effectiveness ratios that range from 329,000 per equal value of life here gained in the societal perspective to 454,000 per quality gain in the healthcare system perspective. Next slide. And here are the results of our conservative treatment benefit scenario. This um, differs from our base case analysis in that we're going to keep the blended emerge and engage hazard ratios for transitions from MCI. That stays the same. What differs is um, transitions from mild Alzheimer's disease, we no longer assume an effect. So instead of assuming it was 50% as effective, we're assuming it's not effective any longer once um, a patient has reached mild Alzheimer's disease and assign a hazard ratio of one. This scenario produces incremental cost effectiveness ratios that range from 1.36 million per equal value of life here gained in the societal perspective to 1.96 million per quality gained in the healthcare system perspective. Next slide. Limitations. Before I close, it's important to consider the limitations when evaluating this, um, this model. So the first is that evidence on the effectiveness of aducanumab is inconsistent between the two pivotal trials. Um, our base case analysis used a blend of evidence from these two trials and required a treatment benefit assumption. We remain uncertain as to whether this average point estimate represents the true effect of aducanumab. And so additional evidence on the effectiveness of aducanumab is needed to reduce the uncertainty and the cost effectiveness as well. <clears throat> the second limitation here is that evidence on aducanumab's effect on health state transitions is limited. We really only had uh, evidence on health state transitions out of MCI and for the eMERGE study. And so this is something we'd like to see going forward is looking at transitions um, out of later disease stages as well. The third is that utilities for the patient and caregiver from cross-sectional studies, which can be challenging to capture um, um, quality of life changes over time, as well as um, the sensitivity of these metrics is always, uh, always a concern. Next slide. Public comments received. Um, we are grateful for the numerous public comments we did receive. Um, one comment was about uh, how thresholds above commonly used thresholds um, are maybe appropriate for Alzheimer's disease. And we are aware of the academic literature that has suggested higher thresholds for more severe diseases like Alzheimer's disease. We're also aware, aware that this work suggests a lower threshold for diseases that are less severe. And the methods by which to assign those, those thresholds for higher, severe, higher severity and lower severity are not well established in health economics or value assessment. And that's partially because it requires a single view of a societal view for severity. 
And also any divergence in thresholds when we assign a lower threshold for less severe and a higher threshold for more severe, more severe, this creates this winners and losers uh, with equal gains of health for, for some patients perceived as more and other patients perceived as less. Another common public comment was that we um, pooled the effect from eMERGE and ENGAGE. And <laughs> we're with you, we didn't, this is something that we had to do to, due to the insufficiency in evidence. We remain uncertain as to if our approach represents truth and that's why we've conducted numerous sensitivity and scenario analyses. But we thought this was an appropriate evidence-based assumption as somewhere in between the two trials given they showed different findings. Next slide. So to conclude, an annual price of $56,000 for aducanumab is not in alignment with its clinical benefits, even under a scenario with optimistic treatment benefit assumptions. And uncertainty in the effectiveness of aducanumab percolates through to uncertainty in the cost effectiveness estimates, where we receive this wide range in cost effectiveness estimates ranging from dominated, more costly, less effective, all the way to around $350,000 per equal value of life year gained. Next slide. And with that, we'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Whittington, um, for the work that you and your collaborators did here and the presentation to us. Um, really outstanding. We have time for questions from our panel. And I'd like to also specifically ask our clinical experts if there are any um, assumptions, clinical assumptions in the model that they would like to comment on and we'll use the raised hand um, function. So let's start with Say, Say Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Whittington, for a, uh, a very um, a clear presentation of a very complex topic with lots of unknowns. Um, one of the things that I was um, uh, wondering about was the um, the population that was being studied and therefore the population that was modeled versus the population that we are uh, thinking that this may be used in. And so one of the, uh, and this may be actually, uh, so what is the uh, upper end of the age limit of the folks that were in the model? And is the average age of 70 kind of uh, a realistic average age of the, uh, of the population that's going to be uh, using this, and how do the results change if the average age of um, uh, the uh, folks using aducanumab increase? A and I also wanted to uh, ask uh, about long-term care. How many long-term care residents were actually included in the original studies, and um, and and how would the results change if we modulate the the numbers in in long-term care already? Great question. So to answer the age question first. Um, this is taken from the trial, <clears throat> but is also uh, pretty well aligns with other um, demographic estimates for this population in early Alzheimer's disease. This was a, a variable that we assessed uncertainty around. And to be honest, the variation in the age doesn't matter as much as the adjudicated on treatment effectiveness, right? So it's just, it, sure, could there be differences by age? Absolutely. This will be going in our interactive modeler that'll allow you to be able to change the age and, and retrie retrieve specific estimates. But um, what's really driving is the educated amount of treatment effectiveness. As for long-term care, we did model transitions to long-term care. Uh, starting at, the population started 8% in long-term care. O over time, transitions to long-term care were quite high. And so um, population in long-term care at the end was was considerably higher. I am not aware of any evidence on the clinical evidence side um, looking at how many of, of the individuals treated were in long-term care. Okay, let's turn to Jeffrey Hotch. Um, if the chair, if it pleases the chair, I'd, I'd like to um, invite Dr. Phillips to go first. She's been patient and in front of me. Is that all right? By all means. Sure. Well, related to what we just heard, um, equity is very important. We all want to see equitable care, but do we have any evidence here on how the results varied by subgroup, by race, by, is there just no evidence that we could use to even look at that? 
Yes, I, I do think this will be brought up later on in our meeting, but the representativeness and diversity of the patient population was quite limited. Um, and so the evidence was not there to be able to model, unfortunately. Okay, Jeff. Thank you, um, Dr. Whittington. Wonderful job creating a collage for us of what's there and helping us appreciate what's not there. I wondered if I could ask you some questions about the tornado diagram. I knew you were going to, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot! I would I'm expect nothing less. <laughs> yeah, ready. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly, and understanding it's going to tell us, I think some of the variables that we don't know and whether or not they make a big difference in the results. Is that right? You're absolutely right. Okay, I think I just lost the ability to share. Uh, yep, can't share anymore. Okay, so looking at table, so if the, anyone else wants to follow along, we're on figure seven in the, in the evidence summary. And um, you might all be saying this doesn't really look like a tornado. I'm not going to critique. I mean, I can't make a better tornado, but I, th I think if I could show it to the group or the group could look at it, I think you're telling us the main message is there's one variable that really, really, really matters. And although we might know a bunch, we may not know a bunch of other things, they don't have as much of an impact on the findings or the conclusions. Is that right? Beautifully said. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the, just, can you remind me, what's the one thing that A, we don't know, and B, has a gigantic impact on whether we conclude this is low value, uh, value, medium value, or high value. That is the aducanumab amount treatment effectiveness. And in that tornado, um, why don't I get risky and see if I can share my screen? Nope. Um, in that tornado, uh, it actually represents really the top two bars that are presented. The first bar is the hazard ratio on transition out of mild cognitive impairment. Um, and you'll see that's like the really long rectangle. Um, that is really driving the results here. And the second bar is transitions out of mild Alzheimer's disease. Now that's dependent on MCI because we assumed it was 50% as effective. So that's why these transitions out of MCI are really driving the results. You might notice on that tornado diagram, um, there's a bar only off to the left. And, and yes, so this doesn't look like a tornado. And that's because the top input matters so much that you don't see this funnel that we typically see because our, our scale is, 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 is very wide. That top bar, does it goes off to the left where our axis in these tornado diagrams represents our base case incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So off to the left, um, we have this long bar and off to the right, we don't have anything. And this is a particular challenge with tornado diagrams in that off to the left are our values less than your incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So say if our incremental cost effectiveness ratio is $1.33 million in our base case, when we use an even more favorable treatment assumption, it becomes around 600,000 per quality gain. So that's off to the left of our axis. But a challenge with tornado diagrams is when we make our, our, our treatment effectiveness less favorable. So we now assume a hazard ratio greater than one. So kind of what we saw in the engaged trial this actually results in a negative incremental cost effectiveness ratio. This is less effective, more costly. Well, a negative value is also to the left of our incremental cost effectiveness ratio, darn it. So um, our, our rectangle is only off to the left side. And so um, that's nothing, that's no error of our report. That is, as, is, is purely math and negative numbers are to the left of our incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Excellent, thank you very much for the summary. I, I think. Maybe I'm getting the bottom line that um, cost effectiveness could be easier if we had better measures of effectiveness. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to Ralph Brindis. Uh, thanks, uh, Mel. Great presentation. I viewed it as a personal tutorial in uh, cost effectiveness, and I learned a lot. Uh, although I suspect it wouldn't matter much. Uh, in any of your calculations, do you look about uh, in, incorporate the costs of safety issues where we have uh, problems with the drug or uh, issues related to stroke and these sorts of things in our cost effectiveness calculations? That's a great question, and we do. So our primary issue here was in ARIA. Um, 
And so this influencer our influences our model in two main ways. One is on the cost side of things. So individuals who had um, ARIA then received a brain MRI every four weeks for the duration of ARIA. Because the average duration was 12 weeks, this becomes essentially three brain MRIs per occurrence of ARIA. So that affects costs. Those aren't free. Another way are that ARIA factors into our results, the safety piece, is in a disutility. And so for symptomatic ARIA, we assumed uh, we applied a, a further reduction in quality of life um, for, for the duration of, of that event. Rena, sorry, you might be on mute. I'm sorry, my fault. Sanket, your question. Thanks, Rena. Thanks so much, Mel, for a great presentation. This was extremely helpful. I have a question about the imaging. Um, so the brain MRIs were included uh, in terms of follow-up, but can you talk about uh, were costs related to PET scans also included? My understanding is that PET scans were an entry requirement into the clinical trials and um, and if we have any information sort of what might be expected in terms of follow-up PET scans as well and uh, that, their role there. That's a great question. Um, as for PET scans as a diagnostic portion of our, of our model, that was not included. That was uh, assumed to kind of occur prior to aducanumab treatment. Um, and I believe this will come up in our policy roundtable or, or maybe before then um, about uh, coverage for that and, and the practices of doing that. And so PET, PET scans were not captured in our model. Catherine. Utilities, could you tell us a bit more? I mean, that's really tough, right? You said that the caregiver utility data were pretty poor. What about the patient utility? utility data and, and how how good do you think that is and would it make any difference if we assumed a worse utility from having this disease? Great question. Um, the utility evidence I, I would say is seemed a little <clears throat> dated but not inconsistent for the, on the patient side. So our estimates are from um, many years ago but there have been recent smaller studies that have uh, relatively the similar numbers. There's been a, a meta-analysis that was recently published looking at patient utilities and, our, and the estimates we use in the model were very similar to those. Um, and so that seemed to be not as uncertain as the caregiver disutilities. Um, now the value of those, uh, getting to the second part of your question, is what if a larger decrement was assumed? What's really driving in the model is, is the difference between the values. So like between MCI and mild, that difference is what's driving the results. And so, you know, say we shifted all those values down 20, that wouldn't change our results as how it would if, we, if, if the, the increment between those became larger. Um, so, so it, is, it is an input that the model is sensitive to. It would produce different results, nothing along the magnitudes that we saw with, um, with aducanumab treatment. Yeah, the incremental point is huge. Yep, yep. But I, I would say there was, there was more consensus, consensus on patient utilities. I think there's obvious questions of like, how do you capture utilities from a patient with, with Alzheimer's disease and can caregivers be a good proxy and are these instruments sensitive enough? So there's a host of issues, but um, there seems to be a relatively good consensus. Bob, Bob Collier. Yeah, Mel, I, I appreciate the, uh, I'd, I'd like to like kind of put you on the spot because I, I end up doing this sort of with uh, patient organizations, advocacy organizations kind of at the end of the meeting, I'm afraid it gets lost sometimes. But the, the disutilities, the costs, the societal impacts, the numbers that we continually do not have, that, that all of our, our all of the comments uh, about each report criticize us for not having and not integrating in there, where would you suggest they come from? I personally uh, really try to put a lot, I, I think a lot of that burden goes on the large patient, patient organizations because there is no one else to do this. Uh, and they could at least uh, hopefully put some pressure on the drug companies to integrate some of that into the trials themselves in terms of, 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 uh, of an on the spot related to this particular trial data collection. 
uh, but, but the patient organizations themselves are the ones that have direct access to the sources of that information. And yet they appear to be putting in no effort whatsoever really on their own to gather that up and provide that to us for these kind of analyses. Anyway, I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're dealing with it. Uh, you know, you're the one that ends up having to, to have this bucket here that, that produce a report for us. Do you have any more insight into where that stuff should come from? Yeah, I, I would say just like we have a healthcare system, this value assessment and the generation of evidence, I think, is also a system. And I think it's everybody's responsibility to either be advocating or collecting these data. So I, I don't think it's it's fair to put this on one group. I think this needs to be a system level effort. Um, and I, I will say, I think there has been um, um, very advanced research done by patient advocacy groups that we have engaged throughout this review. Um, we've worked very closely with them and they've provided us fantastic evidence. Um, so I think some things are on, on do the data exist? And there's certainly gaps as with everything, but there's also methodological considerations. Um, like do we have the appropriate methods to be able to capture this or, or, or serving as proxy that I think is another issue that needs to be observed. So uh, I, 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 I don't think I answered your question. I think I added another issue, um, but that's what I'm gonna stick to. <laughs> Jeff, did you have another question? Really quick question again about tornado diagrams. Um, I really respect Bob's point about getting you what you need. If you could make one wish and someone was going to collect the data that you as a um, person interested in value felt would most improve your analysis, what are the data that you would want collected going yes. forward, let's say? Yes, this is on my, on my shopping list. Yes. I would like, um, the hazard ratio of transitions out of MCI and the hazard ratio and transitions out of mild. Why if do I can you do those? Because that will drive the results. Now, if I can be really choosy, I'd also want it out of moderate, um, but I will settle with MCI and mild because that's what drives the results. Okay, well, uh, that was an excellent question answer period. We are going to move to the next portion of our meeting. Uh, 